this long, long, long season of Sundays that come after Pentecost until we get to Advent again. We spend many, many, many Sundays looking at the teachings of Jesus, as well as the writings of those folks who had an encounter with him and what that meant to them and what he gave them to write about, whether it be Paul or Peter, uh, James, any of the uh, any of the gospel writers, and uh, we look at a lot of parables over the course of Pentecost and. Um, over the past few Sundays, we've been looking at some passages of Scripture from Romans as well as from Matthew that talk about God's love for all of humanity and how God has a plan for each of us to share that love with others. The Scripture passage from Matthew today offers us a chance to come out of Romans for a, a moment and kind of reflect on what we've been looking at in Romans, but also to gain some perspective on how what Paul wrote to that church and to the churches that received that letter, uh, how these parables are meaningful and relevant to our lives and how what Paul wrote actually means something to us. For most of us, the passage is one that we're very familiar with. It's uh, what is commonly known as the story of the loaves and fishes, and it's been told in flannel graphs. If you're old enough to remember flannel graphs, it's been told in flannel graphs and storyboards and uh, cutout dolls and children's picture books for as long as we've been writing about Christian things. But hidden deep within that parable, as with all parables, is a lesson for each of us to take with us. And just like most parables, there are multiple meanings, and what it means for us today may be something different than it meant for us two weeks ago, or two years ago, or ten years ago, because God gives us scripture to speak to us where we are and when we need it. So like most parables, the story of loaves and fishes has some multiple meanings that apply to us. And I want to point out just a couple of interesting facts about this particular parable, the loaves and fishes. It's actually the only parable that appears in all four Gospels. Uh, each Gospel writer you know, has a different take. It was writing to a different audience. But they each included the story of loaves and fishes in their writing. Matthew and Mark even included it twice. They, they included it twice. So, so to be in all four Gospels and twice and two of them, there must be something pretty important that we should get out of this story. So with that being said, I hope that we understand that it's more than just a child's story about the power of God and the goodness of sharing but that there is actually something quite important that we need to hear from it today. So I'd like to begin our reading from the 14th chapter of Matthew, starting with verse 13. And I invite you now to hear the word of God. When Jesus heard what had happened, referring back to the killing of his cousin John the Baptist, now if you don't remember, John came out of the wilderness announcing that this was the Son of God. Now, Jesus had some brothers and sisters at this time, and they didn't believe he was who he said he was, and who, the, who his mother Mary was telling him he was. They, uh, they did not believe until after he was resurrected of who he was. So he was very close to John, his cousin. They grew up together. John knew from the moment that, that, that he met Jesus that they had something, that they were, were destined to, to have something together. And so John came out of the wilderness. He said, I'm proclaiming the coming of the Son of Man. And he actually baptized Jesus in the River Jordan, if you remember that. So they were very close, John the Baptist and, um, and Jesus. And John the Baptist has just been beheaded by Herod. So 
we read that when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And the disciples answered, We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. Bring that here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This ends the reading of our gospel lesson for today. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Now by this point in the ministry of Jesus, he's been traveling throughout Galilee and even into Samaria and back. And he has been teaching, he has been healing sick, he's been restoring sight to blind people, he has been casting out demons. He, he has become pretty well known. He's, he's really busy, and I think that he is not only tired from the ministry that he is in, but he's also grieving the loss of his very dear friend and his cousin John. And nowhere that he could go can he get to be by himself. He needed some time off, and he just couldn't get it. You know, sometimes I think we forget that Jesus was fully human too. And being fully human meant that he was capable of fatigue. He got tired. He got thirsty. He got hungry. And he was filled with emotion. If you can imagine the person that is very close to you passing away, and the crowds of people continuing to press in on you, begging you to do more and more and more, we might kind of think how we would react to that. But then we see when Jesus, he had compassion on these people. So now we've got Jesus, he's exhausted, he's sad, he's withdrawn to a deserted place. And by the time he arrives, word has spread throughout the towns and the villages around the lake. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, and they leave their towns and villages, and they're there waiting on the side of the mountain by the Sea of Galilee when Jesus' boat comes there. So there's a great crowd there. Matthew writes that there's 5,000 men plus women and children. That's a lot of people. And they're there. They're on the banks, they're waiting. And Jesus, somehow, in the midst of his tiredness, his hunger, his fatigue, his need for solitude, summons up more compassion for the people that are there. Matthew tells us that he had compassion for them and he cured their sick. So one by one, they brought their sick to him and he was curing them. And then it gets late. The crowd's hungry. And the disciples tell Jesus, send these folks away now. It's getting dark. Let them go. Let them, send them home. But Jesus says, I want you to feed these people. Little did they know that he was setting them up for what lay ahead of them. Now picture it. We're told that there's 5,000 men there in addition to the women and children. So just on the conservative side... Let's just say there's 20,000 people. That's a man, a woman, and two children for every family there. Let's just say that conservatively there's 20,000 people surrounding Jesus and the disciples with five loaves of bread and two fish. 20,000, that's just a little less than the city of Greer citizens. 
So let's imagine that all the citizens of Greer are gathered over here in City Park, and Jesus is there. He's healed the sick, and there aren't enough restaurants in the city of Greer to feed all these people. There's not enough food. But they have five loaves of bread and two fish. Or as I preached the sermon once, five biscuits and two sardines. <laughs> So imagine if all these residents of Greer showed up and Jesus wanted to feed them. And he says to the disciples, you're going to feed these folks. Where on earth are we expected to find food for so many people, Jesus? We've only got this little bit right here and that's barely enough to feed us. Much less these 20,000 people that are sitting here in this park waiting on you to give them food. Can't you just see Jesus shaking his head going, oh, you of little faith. You know, the disciples have been with him for a while now. They've been with him at least a year. And I can't imagine that Jesus just looks at them and says, haven't you learned anything while we've been traveling? Have you not seen what's been going on while you were with me? Have you learned nothing from going around with me yet? The problem that day could only be resolved with some fresh, miraculous, powerful intervention. So Jesus takes what we might think of as terribly meager resources in his hands, and after lifting it up and blessing it, voila, there's enough to feed everyone. From those five loaves of bread and the two fish, there's enough food for everyone. Now let's not be too hard on the four disciples because we have all the lessons of Scripture at our disposal. And how often do we hold up the mirror to ourselves, look in that mirror and think about how many times we have doubted God's benevolent control in our lives. How many times do we forget that God is in control and God has promised to never leave us nor forsake us and that God has never, ever let us down. But you know, the story doesn't end with they all lay, which would be a miracle in itself. Five loaves and two fishes feeding 20,000 people. They all lay. They all lay and were filled. They were fully satisfied. They weren't just given a snack, they were given a complete meal that satisfied all 20,000 people. No one left the side of that meal that day hungry. The story doesn't even end with that miracle. It goes on to tell us that the disciples went around and gathered 12 baskets full of leftovers. So not only did 20,000 or so people get completely satisfied and have completely full meals, there were 12 baskets of food left over. There is not only fulfillment and satisfaction, there is a surplus. But you know, that's just the way it is with our God. And we forget that a lot of times, don't we? We forget that. In 2017, we forget about five loaves and two fishes. And we want to put God in that box, don't we? Even in the wilderness, at the end of the day, when night is falling, Jesus is there. And when Jesus is there, we should expect fulfillment, abundance, extravagance, and an overflowing of graciousness. But think about the underlying meaning of what happened on the hillside that day. Think about the other things in Scripture that we've read or heard about that talk about God. The other parables, the other miracles. Tell us about the heart of God. Remember when Jesus gave the parable of the farmer going out to sow seeds? And he sowed his seeds and some fell on good ground. Some fell in the rocky soil. Some was eaten by the birds. Some fell in the briars. <coughs> but out of an overabundance of seeds, there was a bountiful harvest. 
when Jesus went to a wedding in Cana and they ran out of wine. Jesus didn't snap his fingers and send a couple of pitchers of good wine over to the host. No, he did, by some estimates, 180 gallons of water changed into excellent wine, enough to last not only the host, but the entire wedding party that went on for the week. And when the prodigal son came home, the father didn't say, come on in, I'll get you a sandwich. No, he threw him a feast and lavished precious gifts on him. And when the good Samaritan found the wounded man lying by the roadside, he didn't call an ambulance and say, there's a guy laying out here in the ditch that needs you to come pick him up. No, he did what he could to fit fix him up right there on the side of the road, and then he put him across his own donkey, and he walked, and he took the man into an inn. And when he got there, he handed over everything to the innkeeper. He said, look, here's everything. Here's my checkbook. Here's my credit card. Here's all my cash. You take care of this man, and when I come back in a week, if you need more, I'll bring more back to you. The heart of God is not about just enough. The heart of God is all about abundance and overflowing. More than enough. More than we need. More than sometimes we expect. And in that vein, God sent Jesus, His only Son, to personally welcome us into the heart of God. And Jesus' actions and his stories and his death and his resurrection all invite every single one of us individually to come into the embrace of the Father. And it's Jesus' invitation that shows us all that God has abundant and overflowing extravagant love for every single one of us. He didn't run out when he gave it to Sharon. There was enough for Sherry, and there's enough for Steve, and there's enough for Lisa, and there's enough for Chris, and there's enough for all of us. God's love doesn't end. Now, this is a God who could have made one flower. He could have made a daisy. And wouldn't that have been a miracle enough for all of us? How did he do it? How did he put together the DNA of this flower, this one flower? flower, this daisy. Is that not a miracle enough in itself? But look at our gardens. Look at the variety of flowers we have. He could have made one tree. He could have made one acorn, one oak tree. But no, he gave us maples and pines and beautiful great myrtles. He could have given us one ocean, one planet, one anything. And that would have been enough miracle for all of us, wouldn't it? But just look at the beauty and the, the diversity of creation that we have been given. And how can we not understand the extravagance of what God's love is for us? Our God is not stingy. He is not miserly. He doesn't give us anything but the exuberance of His creation. He goes above and beyond to give us everything that we need. So with that picture of God in our mind, let's think back on what Paul wrote in the 8th chapter that we read from last week. Remembering this God of abundance, this God of generosity, this God of graciousness, now hear these words of Paul, Therefore, brothers and sisters, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that not wonderful? Is that not wonderful? We have all been free of all of sin. We all wear garments of righteousness. He did not die on that cross just for one or two sins. He did not die for just the really bad sins. He died for all sin, for all time. That's the kind of love 
and extravagance we have from our God through Christ Jesus. We have been adopted into his family as his own beloved children. We're not just acquaintances. We're not just friends of a friend. We are his children, his sons and daughters. We are sons and daughters of a loving and extravagant father with a brother named Jesus Christ. And when we consider all that abundance and the mystery of everything that we have in this realm that we've seen, just think about what must lie ahead for us in glory. God didn't tell us to just wait. He didn't say, just bide your time. You're all alone in this world. No, he, he gave us the Holy Spirit to walk with us. He gave us the Holy Spirit to be our advocate so that we would never feel lost or alone. He spit it within each and every one of us, His Spirit, to remind us that we are more than conquerors. We are called to live victoriously. We are called to live victoriously. And in doing so, we're to be about our Father's business now. We're not supposed to wait. We're supposed to do it now. But most of all, and this is important, with this picture of our abundant and extravagant God that's fresh in our minds, please remember that nothing, absolutely nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Neither powers, no principles, no height, no depth, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And this abundant, extravagant God that we talk about is sitting up in heaven. You know, he could have just waved his hand over us and said, Ah, you're forgiven. But he didn't do it that way. He took a part of himself his only beloved and begotten Son, sent to earth to die for you and for me so that we could have eternal life, so that we could see just how much He loves us. He could have poured His grace and mercy out for a picture and covered each and every one of us. He didn't do it that way. He says, I want you to have something that is so special to me. So absolutely special to me. I'm going to give you my son. Give my own son. He's going to give up his life willingly to show you, you Steve, you Debbie, you David, you Dad, you Louise, you Tim, I'm going to show you how much I love you. My own son. Now that's extravagant and abundant love. And I don't know about you, as much as Tim loves me, nobody's ever loved me that much. As much as my mom and dad loved me, Nobody can touch the love of God that is in my heart right now. Amen. Amen. There's something in the very nature of God that tends toward extravagance and abundance to help us understand how much He loves us. There's something about our God that says, I want to be in a relationship with you so badly and so desperately that I'm going to send my own son to die instead of you. So this morning, I want to close just a little differently than we normally do. I'm going to ask him to go ahead and begin playing number 479. Everybody can just stay seated. You don't have to stand today. 
So I'm going to stand at the altar this morning. And if you've been waiting, the Holy Spirit's been nudging your heart. <clears throat> if you just haven't given in to this extravagant, abundant love that is Christ Jesus. Please let today be the 